And it is Denver Sports Tonight on this Wednesday night in the Mile High City. He's Andrew Mason. I'm Will Peterson. We will roll with you for the next hour as we get toward maybe the most exciting time on the sports calendar in Denver, across the state of Colorado. Mace, I talked about it a little bit with Cello last night, but man, we are really in for a fun three weeks, don't get me wrong. But then once we get through these three weeks, really two and a half weeks, that's when it gets exciting because we will have the NBA playoffs, the NHL playoffs, and the NFL draft. It is going to be like drinking out of a fire hose at the end of April if you are a Denver sports fan. Isn't there a possible scenario for three weeks from tomorrow on that Thursday night where the Nuggets play a postseason game, the Avs play a postseason game, and the Broncos perhaps draft their quarterback of the future? So the only thing I will say no Mm -hmm. is because the NBA and NHL playoffs start on the exact same date, it's very, very slim chance that both the Nuggets and Avs wouldn't either or w- wouldn't still be at home, I guess is what I would say. Okay. Although, you, 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 now that I think about it, what if they're both playing game threes? And those game threes, one of them's in Winnipeg, game three of the NHL playoffs. One of them's in, I don't know, pick your favorite NBA city, New Orleans, game three of the NBA playoffs and the NHL draft. So, I'm going to actually totally change my answer. Yes, there is a chance on that Thursday night because, of course, if games one and two are going on, they will have to stagger at Ball Arena. But, yeah, if they're game three, we all know those round one schedules are weird. There's two-day gaps. There's one-day gaps. There's three-day gaps in the NBA, which drive fans nuts. Yeah, There is a real chance, maybe not real, but it, I, I'd say greater than 20% chance that, yeah, the Nuggets are in New Orleans, the Avs are in Winnipeg, and the Broncos are taking their QB of the future on April 27th. That would be wild. That would be a bonkers night. And respectfully to the Nuggets and the Avs, I think we know what would be number the number one story. Yeah, and I said the 27th. I meant the 25th. But, yeah. yes, it, it would be the number one story because this is still a Broncos town. And for as much as we love the playoffs around here, that's round one, right? We're not talking about – going against game three of the NBA Finals or the Stanley Cup Final, we're talking to go about going against night one of the NFL Draft. It's also consequential in terms of like multi-year consequence. When If the Broncos pick a quarterback in round one, that becomes a defining moment of this decade for the Broncos sure. and probably a defining moment of Sean Payton's tenure because – if you draft a quarterback, then he's basically tying his legacy and what he wants to accomplish in Denver to whoever they pick. Oh, no doubt. I mean, there, there, there's a reason that when you talk about John Elway, he has three Lombardis, yet some fans still want to bring up Paxton Lynch. It, it, it is it is a legacy-type pick when you take a quarterback in the first round, and I choose to focus on the good times with John Elway because there was a heck of a lot more good than there was bad, but there is still a slice of the fan base that is just mad at him for his last five years as the GM, and of course it all went south the night he drafted Paxton Lynch out of Memphis. Yeah. Five playoff seasons before that, five seasons without the playoffs after that. I mean, that's kind of a demarcation point. It truly was the fork in the road yes. for the Elway era as the GM. And the Broncos today, well, we found out that one of their future QBs was in the building. And that wasn't today. That was on Tuesday. But Michael Penix Jr., a variety of reports coming in, Mace. You had been all over this at denversports.com. You had talked to Penix at the Combine. You had talked to Peyton at the Combine at the NFL owners' meetings down in Orlando. You knew this was coming. But it is interesting that we find out that – Hey, Michael Penix Jr. was in Denver yesterday hanging out at Broncos headquarters down there at Dove Valley. In the midst of the draft meetings really heating up there as well when they got back from their the last of their pro day visits last week, they dove into draft meetings setting the board. So their Tuesday was a little bit split between meetings and spending time with Michael Penix Jr. Now – We got an idea from Sean Payton last week what would go into the types of conversations that they would have with a quarterback. He referred to it with J.J. McCarthy, who they worked out and met in person with a couple of Saturdays back. But typical of a meeting is send the quarterback some information the night before. You know they're not going to be able to kind of get everything down, but sort of 
what level of, you know, what can they recall, what can they process in that short amount of time. And although it's not completely analogous to the processor on the field, it does provide a, a good illumination into how much information they can ingest and recall and apply in a short period of time, which is something that you have to have if you're going to succeed in a complex offense. So what did you learn from Sean, I guess, answering that question, specifically when it comes to Penix? Because we do know this guy has a lot of injury history, but it also sounds like it's not just the injury history. You want to learn more than that. Yeah, well, it's probably kind of the second layer to the conversations they've had. The first layer was at the Combine where they actually grilled him, showed some of his bad plays, asked him, hey, what were you thinking here? I mean, basically you get the impression that it was a lot of low lights from the national championship game. Yeah, that was a tough night. Yeah. The fact that they are having this meeting with him today, or this week, pardon me, shows that Penix probably passed the test of what they threw at him in Indianapolis, and they wanted to dive deeper and learn more. Because you only get 30 visits to, the 30 chances to have, people come in the building, have prospects come in the building. They call them top 30 visits, even though it's not necessarily the top 30 on your board. They just call them top 30. You can get around that by going elsewhere, like they went to LSU and and chatted one-on-one and met with Jaden Daniels for a while. They met with J.J. McCarthy at Michigan for a while. But the fact that they're using one of their visits on Michael Penix Jr. shows, okay, there is – a level of interest here, that they're, and they're trying to learn more about him. Yeah, it's kind of like you went on a date with someone, and the first date went well. All right, let's go on a second date. I got a whole Tinder thing here I'm swiping through. I got a lot of options, but I liked you enough that you're worthy of a second date. Michael Penix Jr. got a second date from Sean Payton and the Broncos. You're right. That means the combine went well for him because if he had bombed the combine, you don't give him your number and you never text him back. Michael Penix Jr. not only did that, he was able to get invited on a plane and get to go hang out with the Broncos at their house for a while. Yeah, either that or it's the bachelor analogy. Oh, good old bachelor. He got another rose. Give a rose. He's, he's in contention. Round. Yes. He's in contention. Michael that doesn't Penix mean, Jr. got a rose. That doesn't mean he's the guy, but let's talk specifically about Penix because you and Cecil Lamy have done a ton of this on Orange and Blue today, and I can see your guys' draft boards really starting to come into focus when I watch that show realistically, like if you had to pick a number today, where on the board does Michael Penix Jr. go? And it, I mean, I know that number in some people's eyes could be as high as 12 to the Broncos. And I know there's people driving around out there right now that say 40. He's a he's a early second round guy or even an early to mid second round guy. If you had to hone in on a number, where do you think Michael Penix Jr. ultimately falls off the board in about three weeks here? It's tough because, I mean, I think the range right now is 11 to 50. That's a big range. It is. And especially at the quarterback position where there's a pretty clear gap between number one overall pick, then other picks in the top half of the first round, then back half of the first round, then into round two in terms of the probability of success. I would say I think he ends up going early in the second round, so that would be pick 33 to 38. The only thing that I think could change that, could he sneak into the first round? Yes, here's how. First of all, Bo Nix would go off the board earlier. Like If the Broncos stood pat at number 12 and picked Bo Mm Nix, fifth quarterback off the board in that circumstance, then you could see some clamoring to get back late in the first round, get Penix, and get the fifth-year option that you get with a rookie quarterback that's taken in the first round. A la Lamar Jackson. Correct. That's a circumstance where I could see him going in round one. Otherwise, I expect he'll be early in round two. Okay. Kind of like Will Levis last year. Sure, but it sounds like to me that any Broncos fan who thinks the club may take him at 12, get that thought out of your head. Because listening to you in the last two minutes – it doesn't sound like there's any scenario where the Broncos reach for Michael Penix Jr. at 12. I'd be very surprised, and the injury history is a huge part of this. It's two knee injuries, it's two shoulder injuries, and also on top of that, he's got a very slight build. So that will give some teams some pause before picking him, wondering, okay, can he stand up to the rigors of getting hit? If you have a game... In the NFL, where the pressure is cranked upon him 
much like Michigan did. How is he going to absorb that? And the other thing also, and this is part of why I think the Broncos, when they sat down with Penix at the Combine, asked him about, hey, you know, what did you see here? What were you thinking here on this decision? Is, you know, under pressure, the decision-making in that national championship game was not great. Mm-mm. Now, a week earlier, he played the game of his life. He tore I mean, up we, Texas. It was wild to see the back and forth of the draft chatter on Penix and how it went from one end of the spectrum to the other in in eight days. Yeah, literally from the semifinal to the final. Reality is somewhere in between. There's Look, there's a lot of great film on him. He can make just about every throw. If it weren't for the health concerns, Will, I believe we would be talking about Michael Penix no later than 10, perhaps in the top five. Because wow. he really can make every throw. The arm talent, say, compared to Bo Nix, is substantially better. Well, we talked about from the jump how it was the big three with Caleb Williams and Drake May and Jaden Daniels, and then it became the big four. That by all accounts, J.J. McCarthy is now right there with those guys. You've got Tom Pelissero of the NFL Network saying he could go as high as two to the commanders. I think more and more people are getting on board with the fact that the quarterbacks are going to go one, two, three, four in this draft. So there is now a big four. And then I, I like what you're saying, that if it weren't for the ACLs and the shoulder, that Michael Penix would actually make this a big five. And Bo Nix would be more of the afterthought. Whereas now, I think a lot of people think, hey, QBs are going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. Knicks is probably going to go 12 or 13 of the Broncos or Raiders. And then as you laid out, Penix, end of the first, early part of the second, that feels like a huge ding this guy is getting for those injuries, Mace. I mean, I understand injuries are very real, but of what we were told was that the medicals were all good at the combine. And you're saying, eh, top 10 pick if you hadn't torn those ACLs. So now... 34. It just feels like a big extreme difference to me. Well, it's not just that. It's also there was a reaction to what he did in the national championship game and wondering, okay, this was the defense that featured a whole mess of NFL players, particularly in the front seven, and he didn't respond that well. So you're trying to peel back the layers of what happened. And, oh, by the way, another thing that does come into play with Michael Penix Jr. is – how much did he benefit from the receivers that he had? Because he had a phenomenal room. Now we have an example a few years ago of a quarterback. There was some skepticism about him because of the quality of receivers that he had. And he goes to the NFL and he tears it up. And that, of course, is Joe Burrow. Mm. Good point. LSU was stacked yes. with weapons for Joe. Turns out that it wasn't the receivers making Joe Burrow or Joe Burrow making the receivers. Turns out they were all really good. (laughs) Yeah. And going from that room to Jamar Chase uh, again and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd is not a bad first NFL room for Joe Burrow to get drafted into as well. No doubt. And and the the moves the Bengals have made, you know, basically understanding, you know, T. Higgins isn't going to be a part of this going forward. It's all about keeping Burrow and Chase together because that – you know, there are other good partnerships, but that's the, that's the one that's special in Cincinnati. All right, so let's play a little game then. I'm going to okay. put you on the spot here just a little bit because we're three weeks away from the draft and I want to handicap this thing. And your percentages don't have to add up to 100 because I know you're very smart and you're good at mental math, but I'm not going to put you on the spot that much. But let's do percentages of the six quarterbacks that they end up in orange and blue as Andrew Mason thinks here today. And I can probably guess some of these, but even the obvious ones I'll ask you. So I understand this first guy is probably going to be 0.0, but Caleb Williams is a Denver Bronco. 0.1%. Ah, there we go. You're telling me there's a chance. Yeah, literally about one in a thousand. One in a thousand. Is what I'm saying because, okay, that's that's the one in a thousand chance that they would trade up and somehow get the number one overall pick when the Bears have shown no indication they're going to move on. I, I probably am even overstating it by saying 0.1%. Or if there it was might some sort there. of scandal in the next three weeks and he fell. I don't know. Yeah. That, that falls into the one in a thousand category, a la Laramie Tunsil. You know, something yes. something a little wacky happens. All right. I agree with you, 0.1%. Let's just keep moving down the board, sort of where people have generally mocked him. Let's, let's go to Drake May next, even though some people may disagree, but we're going to get to all six of these guys. Odds Drake May... One to a hundred percentage wise is a Denver Bronco. Ten percent. 
is that more that the Broncos may not like May, or he's simply unattainable based on where they fall in the draft board? More the latter than the former. Is he going to go two? I think he'll go two or three. I just don't think the Broncos are going to be able to get in position to get to get him. Well, then let's get to Jaden Daniels out of LSU, Heisman Trophy winner, who many project in the top three. Uh, this is my guy, Mace. I, I've made no secrets I, on this show, whether I'm with you or with James or with Cello or Jake or whoever, that I want Jaden Daniels to be the next quarterback of the Denver Broncos, and I'm holding on hope to the fact that the commanders could take McCarthy at two, Daniels could slip to four, Broncos could do business with the Cardinals. What are the odds Jaden Daniels is slinging around at training camp this summer at Dove Valley? 1.9%. Oh, Mace, you're a dream killer. Sorry. You're a dream killer. He's that much lower than Drake May? I don't think he's getting past Washington at two. Oof. And we were having this conversation today on Orange and Blue today. Cecil Lammy and I were. Jane Daniels and Cliff Kingsbury seems like that's a partnership that can work. Of course, Cliff Kingsbury now guiding the offense in Washington under Dan Quinn. That seems like a good pairing that would be successful. Breaking my heart, but I don't disagree. I guess I'm holding on a little too much hope to this Pelissero report about our next guy, and that is J.J. McCarthy. So far, you've given Williams point one, Drake May 10% chance, Jaden Daniels 1.9% chance. J.J. McCarthy, he's one of the two names that has been linked to Sean Payton the most. What is the percentage chance J.J. McCarthy is the next quarterback of the Denver Broncos? 20%. See, even that feels low to me. Well, you're starting to scare me a little bit. 20% is that because McCarthy's just going to go top four and, and convincing Arizona to do business with you at four may not be that easy? Minnesota may be able to offer more in a deal for number four. But you agree he's going four at the latest? I, I would be surprised if he goes later than four. All right. Greatly surprised. So now I Because I think Arizona's moving down. Monty Austin Fort's going to – I think he'll. I think Austin Fort will move down, then he'll move back up. So now we're going to get spicy because you've given no guy a higher than 20% chance of being the next quarterback of the Denver Broncos. This name is a polarizing one, and there's a lot of strong opinions on him in Broncos country because he was in college for like six years, and he's 24 years old. But what are the odds that Bo Nix is here next season? 30%. Yeah. That's not inspiring to me. And I know you're just passing on the numbers. You're not telling me what you want. You're not telling me what you think they should do. You're just telling me how it is. But, I mean, 30 30 starting to feel pretty real. The thing is, with Bo Nix, you could stand pat and get him. You might be able to trade down and get him. Right. So you could add capital, yeah. and I think that would make fans feel better. And the thing that you have to ask yourself in terms of overall team building is, what's a better team? Is it the Broncos with J.J. McCarthy trading up to four but sacrificing potentially two first-round picks or Pat Sertan in a first-round pick mm -hmm. to do it. So, I mean, it's possible that if you trade up for J.J. McCarthy, you might not have another first-round pick until 2027. After giving up all your first for Russ right. and giving up a first for Sean? I mean, first-round picks would become very foreign to the Denver Broncos. Or it's you're sacrificing your first-round pick and you're maybe trading Pat Sertan and not trading the 2026 pick or not trading other draft capital. And those are players those those draft picks are players that would be part of what you're doing so what's a better team jj mccarthy without some high level draft capital that would become players without maybe pat sertan or bo nix plus maintaining your draft capital and keeping pat sertan around i think bo nix and and keeping the extra weapons that you would ultimately add around him or potentially add on defense that's sort of the that's if you're sitting there logically if you're going beyond the okay, we love this quarterback. If you're making a logical decision, that's where it has to come from. Like, And and can Bo Nix do 90% of what Sean Payton is going to want in a quarterback? Yeah, he will keep you on rhythm. He'll keep you on schedule. He's accurate. He'll lead his receivers on short to intermediate stuff. He's going to set them up for yardage after the catch. So there's a lot of things in a Sean Payton offense that Bo Nix probably can do very well, but what he lacks in his bag is the driver. All right, let's close this exercise out with actually two okay. things because I'm going to do Michael Penix Jr. and then I'm also going to do the field yep. because I think we have to do the field. The Michael Pratt's, the Spencer Rattlers of the world. What are the odds Michael Penix Jr. wears orange and blue next season? 13%. Okay, so you clearly think that Nix is the favorite. 
followed by McCarthy, then Penix, then May, then Daniels, then Williams. Yes. So that leaves, I don't know, 25-ish percent that, Bingo. You're, go- that you're going to put on 25%, the field. 25%, and let's put it all together. Caleb Williams, 0.1. Jaden Daniels, 1.9. That's 2%. Drake McMay, 10%. That's 12. J.J. McCarthy, 20. 32. Bo Nix, 30. That's that's 52. Um, or 62, Or 62, right? pardon me, 62. Yep. Michael Penix Jr., that's 62 plus 13, 75. The field, 25%. That's 100. And I want to make it add up. Give me a name or two out of the field that I should know as, hey, they just took Brock Bowers in round one. Everybody panic. Well, maybe don't panic because they could get player X, Y, and Z in rounds three, four, five. Michael Pratt, Spencer Rattler. Those are just the two you've honed in on. Yeah, Tulane and I'm South in, Carolina. Yeah, I'm intrigued by Joe Milton out of Tennessee on day three, but I don't think you bring him in as the primary young quarterback that you'd add. I could be sold on Bo Nix and then – Joe Milton, round five, round six. You know, the old RG3, Kirk Cousins thing. The thing is, Milton, not very accurate. Smart, maybe the strongest arm of any quarterback at the Combine this year, but accuracy needs a lot of work, and sometimes that's not something you can get up to speed and coach into a player. So I wouldn't be if, – if the only quarterback they picked was Joe Milton on day three – I don't know that I'd be all that comfortable with that as the only young possibility. Yeah, I think people going to camp with Joe Milton and Jarrett Stidham and Ben DiNucci would be a little nervous, to say the least. Yeah, the Bazooka Joe nickname, which he doesn't like, uh, it's actually pretty accurate because he's got a cannon. But as we saw uh, at times in the Senior Bowl and we saw on the film from Tennessee this past year, not always knowing where it's going. Well, it was a fun game. I appreciate you playing along, and good My job pleasure. getting exactly to 100%. Hey, guys, Denver Sports, we are on YouTube at Denver Sports. Go leave a like on a video, maybe drop in a comment, share one, or most importantly, hit that subscribe button. You can